Presented by Caltech. Thanks everyone and thanks for inviting me to give this talk as well. Um, I'm Vikram Ravi, I'm a new faculty in the astronomy department here at Caltech. And I'd like to say a little bit about some of the rather data intens intensive things we do over in Cahill. Um, Cahill may, might seem like a strange building across the road, all you know, orange and everything, but some really um, interesting and relevant things go on inside there. I'd like to introduce you to a few of the projects that we're involved in. Um, but first to really, um, you know, set the scene. Astronomy, as you can appreciate, has incredibly rich data. Um, in this Hubble image of about, about a part of the sky about the, a hundredth the size of the full moon, we have several thousand galaxies. Every one of these spots is a galaxy. Some of them uh, observed when they were only at a few percent of the age of the universe. Now, as you can imagine, um, we face a lot of problems in analyzing data such as these. For example, which one is the oldest galaxy in this image? Um, which one is the nearest galaxy? Which one is the smallest, the largest? Which one has lived for the shortest amount of time or the longest? Which ones are in the process of merging with each other or perhaps being disintegrated by tidal interactions with nearby galaxies? It's really difficult to develop um, a classification and discovery scheme for data as rich as these. And of course, as you might also imagine, it is very difficult to follow up you know, to get very detailed data sets on every one of the 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe, which is where we hope AI comes in in the future. And so just to split up the problem into two parts, astronomers really want to, first of all, discover the rare unidentified objects that tell you a little bit more about new physics or perhaps new and not understood evolutionary pathways. Um, we also don't just want to discover individual objects, interesting as they may be. Um, we also want to find objects that can be identified only by finding agglomerations of lots of little things, like large streams of stars around the Milky Way, or perhaps very faint dwarf galaxies that provide new insight into the nature of dark matter. However, we have several challenges in what we do. And I think I can generally say that astronomers are faced with highly heterogeneous, incomplete, corrupted data where very often we have a very poor understanding of our statistical uncertainties. Um, in terms of scale, um, and this is data after we have gone through the rather tedious process of identifying every significant object in our even larger data sets that we collect. In terms of scale, the current sort of state of the art is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has over a billion catalogued objects and about four million objects with detailed spectra, detailed um, observations of their um, emission at different wavelengths of light. However, in the future, in just four years from now, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope in Chile will increase our um, observed view of the universe by several orders of magnitude. For example, their pipelines are expected to detect 30 trillion unique objects in the sky, many of them related, many of them highly uh, degenerate with one another. Nonetheless, we are faced with the problem of classifying and understanding all these objects, as well as discovering both unique things and trends among them. And so when we think about the discovery space, and this, this is an image courtesy of um, George Jogowski, um, we like to think about the discovery space of each of the surveys that we do. And as you can imagine, again, um, a lot of you being um, experts in artificial intelligence, intelligence and machine learning, the idea of decomposing your observations into key parameters along which you might be able to find spaces that are unexplored and hence ripe for discovery 
is really important and something that we think a lot about in astronomy. The second thing, of course, is classification. Um, and again, um, it should be pretty clear that in order to do a systematic study of any population, we need to be able to identify all the objects within that population. Systematic studies require accurate classification. However, um, I, I really do feel like a lot of what we do in astronomy today is um, it still relies on the concepts of almost diagrams. We have classic diagrams that you might have seen in high school, like the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, otherwise known as a um, color magnitude diagram or color-color diagrams. Um, we make various diagrams, plot A against B and look for trends, look for clusters, almost by eye in many cases. Um, however, Astronomy is moving into a regime where machine learning techniques are being applied more and more to the classification problem. For example, a simple question um, such as, when you take an astronomical image like this one on the right, which one of the objects is a star and which one is a galaxy? Really simple question, right? Um, and yet it's something that has occupied us for quite a while, but now machine learning techniques are standard in solving this question, where you can see that um, an algorithm has identified different things at, with different sources with these um, ellipses and is able to then say which one is a star, which one's a galaxy, which then allows you to do things like if you were to find a flash of light in the sky, you're able to um, then associate it with something behind it that could either be a star or a galaxy. You know where it came from. And so there are several opportunities for AI in astronomy. This is sort of the main message I want to get across. I want you all to help us out, in other words. Um, first of all, and probably most importantly, is automated clustering and anomaly detection. What are the outliers and what are the clusters? Um, secondly, of course, is what is everything, right? Let's classify all the objects out there and thus recognize patterns and trends in the data. The third thing is that we're very often faced with very messy data, and I'll show you a few examples of these in a few minutes. Um, so quality control becomes critical. And finally, and somewhat interestingly, I feel like there really is an opportunity for AI-assisted algorithmic development to really push the boundaries of um, the logic that we even use to identify things and plan observations and push forward into new discovery spaces. Um, there are several um, ongoing applications of AI in astronomy, ranging from the discovery of new exoplanets to the discovery of new supernovae and asteroids, fast radio bursts, pulsars, gravitational lensing, ET, or so we hope one day, and even things that we don't have any idea about yet. The list goes on. Um, what I do is primarily to work with radio telescopes like these. Um, these are all uh, different kinds of radio telescopes around the world, which are sensitive to radio waves from space, several, several, several orders of magnitude weaker than the kinds of radio waves that we, that we emit on Earth. Um, and these all happen to be telescopes that have also published papers on a topic that I'm very interested in at the moment, which is this, um, these new and mysterious fast radio bursts. What are they? Well, they're kind of cool. Uh, we find them in data that looks something like this, um, where on the x-axis is time in milliseconds. This is roughly 130 milliseconds across, and this is frequency in megahertz. We, we, ha we use these radio telescopes to observe regions of the sky with very high time resolution and frequency resolution, and thus search for bursts that look like those. That's in real time. Um, that sweep, you see, is... is um, I think to date the brightest fast radio burst yet detected, um, which was seen at a telescope in Australia called the Parkes Telescope. Here it is a bit slower. What we observe are these swept frequency signals where the signals as they um, pro move to lower frequencies are delayed by the square of the frequency, very characteristic. And so this becomes a fairly well-defined problem. Right? You need to, be, you can, you need to uh, search for all the different parabolic shapes in your data. And in many cases, these data can be images like these. Um, and so what are they? 
Well, we don't really know, and that's why we're very excited about them. Um, what we see are roughly 1,000 uh, per sky per day of these millisecond duration bursts of radio waves that when they're on are among the brightest sources of radio waves in the sky. Um, we know that they come from distant galaxies, um, but we don't know what makes them. Uh, we don't know if any object within the Milky Way galaxy that we can observe that can make these things. And until very recently, there were more theories than detected bursts for what they are. Um, they also appear to pass through intergalactic matter, which in, it, which in itself is kind of surprising, but even more so because we really don't know where this matter is. And in some senses, until we had developed a sample of fast radio bursts, we didn't really know whether this matter was primarily bound to galaxies or diffusely distributed within the cosmic web. Um, and <laughs> as you can see from the, um, we've had four covers in Nature and Science in the last three years on this topic alone. Um, they're a very compelling question. Um, so this is an example of a fast radio burst. Um, if you see in, in this looped image, you will see a, the burst appear over and over again. Um, this was one that we detected at Caltech's Owens Valley Radio Observatory a few months ago. Um, this image, um, each frame is 131 microseconds, and so it's slowed down by a factor of 10,000. Um, this particular burst was, um, uh, it originated from a galaxy at a distance of 7.9 billion light years, and we detected it with 10 uh, dishes like these, um, just four and a half meters across, um, $1,700 a piece from Alibaba.com. Um, it was a prototype for an array that is a bit bigger, called the Deep Synoptic Array, um, which will consist of 110 dishes and is led by myself and Professor Greg Hallinan over in the astronomy department. And when complete, um, by hopefully late next year, will proceed to detect well over 100 fast radio bursts each year, as well as identify for um, um, the first sort of uh, few times the host galaxies from which they originate. Um, we're fully funded, which is nice. Um, but the key message I want to um, uh, convey about this telescope is that it really is a software telescope. Um, our data rate is something like 440 gigabits per second. But the signals that we want to detect occupy only one billionth of the data. It's incredibly sparse. Most of the data, as you saw from the earlier image in the time frequency space, is, really, is a really, really, really good representation of noise. And yet we want to find these very rare signals within it. But the problem is actually even worse than that um, because we're faced with the problem of human-generated false positives, otherwise known as radio frequency interference. And so for every fast radio burst that we hope to detect, we expect something over 100,000 false positives as well. Why is this? Well, um, it turns out we're very creative at radiating radio waves. And so here are a few examples that I drew on my whiteboard this morning. Um, first of all, if you have um, sort of narrow band beacons, again, this is time and this is frequency. If you have pulsed narrow band beacons, you can imagine fitting a bunch of different parabolas through them. If you have um, sort of slightly broader band cell phone transmissions, it so happens to be the case that cell phones radiate swept frequency pulses over short ba over narrow bandwidths. They again can be fit with parabolas. And finally, um, you might have your air conditioner turn on, which will result in a broadband increase in the radio power. Now, because we're analyzing time series data, we baseline the data, we detrend it. And in doing so, um, you might imagine that after this step change, you would immediately detrend over here, which makes a step change actually look like a pulse. And you're in trouble, because that is another fake FRB. Now, this is a problem that, again, as you might appreciate, is ripe for um, um, being tackled by ML implementations. And to date, there are six papers uh, doing so, which is either a few or very many, depending on how you look at it. Um, 
uh, three of which uh, simply um, apply random forest techniques to classify feature vectors. Um, the other three of which actually do convolutional neural network, um, apply CNNs to actually um, identifying images in the time frequency space, like so. Now, these tend to work, and um, we are hoping to use um, either one of these implementations or our own. But I think that especially the fact that we also have not just this sort of image data, but image data like this, which are actual images of the sky taken at very high time resolution, means that we can adopt a more complicated and yet more um, efficacious approach that has been done on only the time frequency data so far. And so the specific um, opportunities within the project that I lead um, include things like very simply lowering the detection threshold. The lower your threshold, the more detections you have. Um, also, there is the big question of identifying the ultimate limits of our population. At the moment, we search for what we know. We want to be able to search for things we did not expect. And I feel like that is a problem that is very um, ripe for tackling with AI techniques as well. Um, we don't know how complete our data sets are at the moment. Um, there's also an application um, of especially computer vision techniques to enhance the angular resolution of our array above the sort of classical um, um, resolution limit of a telescope. And we're also um, probing a new discovery space within the astronomical sky, the combination of high time, frequency, and angular resolution. And we'd love to be able to find things we did not intend to find or even expect to see so far. Um, this is leading into a larger project uh, called the DSA 2000, where, as you can tell from the name, um, it will have 2,000 antennas, not, uh, not 110. And um, in this case, um, there are several more applications that I won't spend a lot of time on at the moment. Um, this telescope is still in the early stages of planning. Um, but one really interesting thing is that, um, unlike many telescopes, we expect to produce um, high fidelity images of the sky on the fly without doing a significant amount of post-processing, which requires an extremely good forward model for the whole array and all the various involved systematics. Um, in this case, I mean, this sort of thing also yields you know, the problem of um, uh, deriving science from the vastly increased number of sources over previous surveys by nearly three orders of magnitude. Um, and we also hope to detect several thousand um, fast radio bursts as well. Um, now, I just want to spend a couple of minutes on another project within the astronomy department, of which um, uh, Dima, sitting over there, is um, the expert in the room, um, author of um, a few Dua Vital papers on this. Um, but the Zwicky Transient Facility, or the ZTF, is another project um, involved in time domain astrophysics within the astronomy department here. This project is based at the Palomar Observatory and uses a 48-inch Schmidt telescope to take around 1,000 images of the sky every night over an area now that is about, um, uh, about 200 times the size of the full moon, so rather large. Um, you, you can imagine that it's sort of um, a few times the size of your fist on the sky. Um, and the amazing thing about this is that it is able to scan the entire sky every three nights and do this over and over and over again with the aim of finding almost anything that varies on those timescales. Things like supernovae, things like asteroids streaking across your image, things like very fast um, optical transients due to gamma ray bursts. Um, the list goes on, including the afterglows of gravitational wave events detected by LIGO as well. Um, again, the data challenge is immense. However, the ZTF team has been very actively developing and using machine learning techniques for a long time. And with the main applications that I want to highlight here of um, a real bogus um, classifier identifying a probabilistic, um, providing a probabilistic measure of whether your detected time variable event is 
actually astrophysical or due to some artifact of data processing or something else, as well as um, techniques to identify streaking asteroids within images. Um, streaks, of course, look different from stationary sources in the sky. Um, and so just to conclude, um, I'd like to just finish with almost a challenge, which is that as I was thinking about this talk, um, it sort of came to me that at least in astronomy, we've really been using um, machine learning techniques that I feel like most undergrads going through the program here at Caltech would be familiar with. Um, we're not, in some sense, really, really, really pushing the boundary to a level where I would hope that AI can actually replicate the entire discovery process. So discovery in science, right, is not just finding things. It's finding things that are broadly consistent with physics that we know. It is finding things that you can find again and again and again, so uh, repeatability. It's finding things which also have implications that, or predictions that you can then go back and test. Um, and it's also finding things where you know for sure that they're not really noise. You've got to understand your uncertainties. And I would absolutely love to see an AI implementation that could actually replicate this entire process in our data, not just stages of it at a time. I just want to point out that there are several um, interested faculty and staff in Cahill in machine learning techniques. Um, Dima Duev and I are here at the moment, and several others are in Cahill. So please come talk to us if you're interested in working with us. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> you have pre-filtering steps, I mean. Abs you mean for the 440 gigabits a second? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we do, we do. Yeah. So we can, um, we can break it down in various ways. Uh, one way is to break it down effectively into an image. Um, so to co-add a lot of the data into individual pixels on the sky. Um, and then integrate to the time resolution we're interested in. Um, but again, that's almost a sense of searching for what we expect to find. Right. But yes, it's a lot of data. Right, so in the general case, you can't really do the filtering if you want to find something you don't know about. In the general case, you can't. So you've got to, you've got to break it down somehow. So, yep. so the AI or the machine learning that's been useful thus far is you already sort of know what you're looking for. You just want to create some labels to filter it more efficiently. Yeah, that's pretty so much is it. That a good summary of what Yes, that's a good summary, yeah. And is yeah. your interest in just doing that on a bigger scale? Or, I mean, so what you're, what you're suggesting here is something fundamentally different. Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's, that's, I mean, that's where I'd like to go because, I mean, we can always find what we know about and build up our samples and so on, but that's not how new discoveries are made. Um, and so there's, there's another way of looking at it, which is that, the universe is pretty, pretty much the same whichever way you look at it. And also when you look at it, look at it over and over again, you're likely to see the same things. And so there's no need to do everything at once, but you could imagine techniques where you um, partition your data in one way or, in, or sum it up in one way, search that, and then sum it up another way, search that to break down the problem. Uh, no, we don't. So we search in real time. That's, that's what I'm saying. So you try something, then you try something else, then you try oh, something exactly. else. Sort of way is irrelevant because the universe is the same. Yes. Yep. We call it archiving on the sky. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 